you know, I was supposed to, you know, end up getting the win. Okay, sorry, people, it's predetermined. Um, and, you know, things were going. I remember going out there. And, you know, I remember running to the corner, boom, d kicks me in the stomach, and I go down. I remember him lifting me up, but something just didn't feel right. Welcome back to Dark Side of the Ring Unheard, the podcast from the Hit Vice TV series where we dive in to the Dark Side archive in search of insights and poignancy and recollections all from some of pro wrestling's famous and infamous characters some of its lesser known it's been a wonderful ride thus far and we're glad that you're back with us i'm jack Encarnacio from the lapsed fan wrestling podcast joined by my lapsed fan co-host jp sorrow as well as dark side of the rings executive producer and co-creator evan husney dark side of the ring returns for season five coming up tuesday at 10 p.m eastern time on Vice TV, 10 new episodes coming your way, and we kick it off with the story of Earthquake, John Tenta. Evan, what can you tell us about what's next on Dark Side? Yeah, kicking off the season with an episode about Earthquake, something I never really thought we would do as an episode uh, for the show, to be quite honest. it was this was this This episode was a big surprise to all of us, I think, in terms of how emotional it wound up being. Um, I, I'm, I'm really proud of this episode. I think it's one of the best in the entire season. Um, and I was a huge Earthquake fan growing up. I always loved, you know, the big guys, the Bam Bam Bigelows, the Earthquakes, and so on and so forth. And um, I can recall going all the way back to season two. Uh, I have a good friend named Mike Lawrence. Shout out. He's a comedian, a big wrestling fan. And he always told me, you guys should do a John Tenta episode. And I, I never quite gave it much Credence. I mean, he'd always would tell me this story about him uh, being a sumo wrestler in Japan and uh, dropping out. I mean, he, he, he rose through the ranks and he lived the lifestyle and did the whole thing over in Japan to become a very serious sumo wrestler. And um, he told me a very touching story about how he met his wife. Um, and that kind of did stick with me that, that there is this very sort of human side, very, you know, gentle giant side of John Tenta. And that was really solidified to me even more so when uh, it was a few years ago, maybe, I don't know, four or five years ago, when John Tenta's son uh, circulated a photograph that made it around on Reddit, I think. And it was this very sweet photo of Earthquake and his son playing Game Boy together on like uh, like on the couch. They were laying on the couch together and like you know, he was playing Game Boy with his son and there's just something so adorable about this photo but also so <laughs> contrasting to this giant hulking crazy guy that you'd see in the ring. And so we just decided to talk to his family first and just see, you know, is there a story here? Is there, you know, what's the deal? And his family wound up being so unbelievably appreciative that we would approach them with this that they were like 100 percent on board and so this episode they're the stars of the show honestly his 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 wife his widow she's amazing incredibly strong person she's like four foot ten you know and he was like six foot whatever uh but she's a she's an amazing personality and then of course um their three kids are in the film um they're just amazing people you know you're, you're going to get to know them and 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 their stories and one thing i didn't really know was you know john tenta's end you know because he did pass away i remember that from when i watched was watching wrestling as a kid but i never knew exactly what the circumstances were um and you know in this episode it definitely paints a picture of you know it was a very sad sort of slow bout with cancer that um is really heartbreaking to see. And it was something I did not know, the sort of withering away of this larger than life character. So be prepared for that. A lot of interesting voices in the episode, a lot of some, uh, some of which we've never had on the show. A couple that I'm very excited about, I'll shout out real quick. Uh, Haku is in the episode. So uh, the very first time that Haku has been on dark side cameras. And uh, Fred Ottman, of course, his former tag team partner, Typhoon of the Natural Disasters, is in the episode. And it was sort of a way for us to, you know, touch on Shockmaster, to get some Shockmaster reenactments in the show once and for all. And so you're going to see that on the episode, which is a lot of fun. And even more fun than that, and I'm, I won't try to spoil anything more than this, but Haku had never seen the Shockmaster footage before. He had never seen it before. I don't know how he avoided it. Um, and then, of course, you know, Jake Roberts is in there. You got Earl Hebner. 
uh, Fumi Saito gets in there, um, you know, as sort of a historical voice, and uh, Jerry Sags from uh, the Nasty Boys. I think a lot of people are going to have the reaction of like earthquake episode, really, and because uh, he was a, uh, by all accounts, you know, one of the nicest people. Everyone said, you know, behind the scenes, but I think the loss of him is kind of overwhelming to the point of where you can see why it would be a fit for the show. So. Um, so yeah, there it is. The Ballad of John Tenta. Uh, the, or it's called the Ballad of John Earthquake Tenta. And you'll, you'll understand why that's the name of the episode. Uh, when you see it, do not forget 10 PM Eastern time on vice TV, 10 all new episodes from the fine folks at dark side, no doubt contributing further fodder for projects like this down the line. There's so much in the dark side archives that we can play with. And one story one sort of apocryphal tale in some ways that's not necessarily buried in the archives, but wasn't the subject of its own dedicated episode, kind of came up tangentially in another episode that was done by the crew for, on rather, the WWF's Brawl for All tournament, an ill-fated idea in 1998 to have pro wrestlers go on live television and have legitimate fights and see what happens. Of course, everyone just ended up getting hurt and it was a complete disaster, uh, but Uh, One of the participants in that tournament was a gentleman whose voice you just heard by the name of Darren Drozdov. And Darren Drozdov was an upstart pro wrestler, football player that got lured into the the wonderful world of pro wrestling and ended up suffering uh, one of really the most tragic and tough injuries that any wrestler has suffered, particularly in the WWF uh, in October 1999, where uh, a stunt went wrong and he landed on his head and was paralyzed for the rest of his life in the middle of the ring as they were taping a television show. Now, Darren Drozdov was confined to a wheelchair ever since that happened to him in 1999, and anyone who's seen the Brawl for All episode of Dark Side of the Ring knows who it is. He's, he's in the wheelchair, of course, during the courses of the interviews, and he mentions at the end what had happened to him, but we're going to get a little bit more familiar with Darren Drozdov, as, as you did, Evan, uh, sitting with him and going to visit with him and really getting a, a first eye view, a first hand account, really, of, of what had become of Darren Drozdov. We, we all knew him. We all watched him at, at a point when the WWF was red hot, the late 90s, the Attitude Era. A lot of people knew him. He was known as Puke. We'll get into that later as far as where that name came from. But you spent a lot of time with him and, and gave us a window into what had happened to this guy that the last we heard, he was just the victim of an in-ring tragedy. Going back to the Brawl for All episode and this interview in particular is very significant because it was the first interview we ever did for season two, was traveling out uh, to New Jersey where Draws lived. Um, RIP, we lost him last year, June of 2023. Um, Yeah, so it was very significant um, for that because, you know, it was such a long road to getting to season two. It was a long road to getting season one on the air. Uh, there was a lot of uphill battles and um, a lot of hurdles to jump through to not only get the show made, but to get to, to get the show on the air. And um, there was a risk at a, at a certain point of the show basically being shelved for many years and folks not being able to see it for a long time. So um, getting that sort of, if you call it vindication or be, you know having the show come out and... Um, to uh, have an audience build around it and there'd be excitement and wanting there. And then of course, getting a green light for a season two was, was huge for, you know, Jason, my, you know, my partner in crime in this and uh, the co-creator of the show, it was, it was a huge deal. So I remember going back, uh, traveling out there to meet draws who I was a fan of and very eager to talk to and very excited about talking to. It was a, it was, it was kind of a marker of a big significant point in, 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 in our lives and the show. So I'll always remember that. Um, And I'll always remember Draws uh, from (laughs) being exposed to him first, uh, probably on Raw, you know, watching Monday Night Raw, but it really didn't land for me like it did when um, I saw him on Beyond the Mat because, you know, he's got such an indelible (laughs) part of that documentary from 1998 or 99 when that came out. Um, Draws is sort of used as the example of how they recruit and uh, you know, someone from the outside world into wrestling and they design a whole gimmick and a whole, um, you know, um, identity for this person. And it was great to have, you never saw access like ever before, like Beyond the Mat had to have cameras inside Titan Towers, you know, where this young, you know, bright eyed, bushy tailed, you know, Darren Drozdov is walking. Yeah. Yeah, lip pierced, right? You know, uh, walking into this totally, you know, naive to the business. He's, you know, he's 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 getting into it, and here he is. He's going to be saddled with his gimmick. What is it, man? And it's you're gonna be 
puke. You're gonna puke. He's gonna puke. Anyone who's seen that documentary <laughs> remembers this. That's that's it. That's the that's the part you do remember. That and you know, I guess fully getting stitched up. But oh yeah, that yeah, of course. But it was it was such a big deal, and it was it was um, so that was cool, you know, to see him there. And of course, I do remember, you know, his tragic accident and um, hearing about it when it happened. You know, I was an active watcher of you know, wrestling at that time. And when we put together the Brawl for All episode, we sort of thought that it could be um, something where we use that as sort of the main um, thrust of the story. Like it's kind of all these little stories are, you know, the, like the Brawl for All is connecting all of them together because it's such an absurd idea, but it touches so many different wrestlers. You know, it touches Ken Shamrock and Dan Severin. It you know, D'Lo Brown, Carl Ouellette, you know, uh, draws, of course. Um, and so we thought that was kind of a way we could look at it. But then, of course, you get to cutting it and you're like, well, you don't have enough time for that idea because you just got to get, you know, what the, the main story of the Brawl for All is across. But, you know, when we met Draws and we got to his house and, and started interacting with him, uh, obviously, you know, it was hard to, to not notice his condition and, you know, the way in which he has to live, he had to live his life. Um, you know, confined to this chair and um, just all the help that he needed around the house in order to do things, you know, from the paralysis. And it was just over, you know, it, it, it was like overwhelming at first, but he was so disarmingly polite and um, nice and had such an amazing like attitude. It almost took you back. Like his outlook on life was so positive, you know, despite, you know, um, you know, being dealt this hand with this accident, this horrible accident. So, um, that took me by surprise right away. And, and he was so um, stoked to be a part of this project and was so giving of his time. And um, yeah, and, and, and obviously seeing him, you know, the way that he was, we knew that putting him on camera, if you didn't explain sort of, or didn't contextualize what had happened to him, it would be this thing that people would distract people and they'd be wondering what's going on. Was this, you know, was he injured during the brawl for all, you know, or whatever. So we had to contextualize it in some way. And so we touched on uh, in the episode very briefly at the end, we touched on, you know, what, what, what happened, which we'll get into here. Um, but it is a regret that I have uh, deeply, especially after losing him, which I had no idea that, you know, that obviously would have happened or anything, but it, 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 it would have been so great you know, to do a dedicated draws episode. And, and I definitely feel remiss that we never got that opportunity. Yeah. That's, that's part of what we're trying to do here with the unheard series is, is sort of, you know, bring these voices back who, when dark side sat to interview them, we didn't know we'd lose them so soon. New Jack was an example of that. And, and draws is certainly an example of that as well. JP, you would remember, of course, draws is puke in the Legion of doom. Everybody knows the Legion of doom road warriors. One of the more famous. I was going to say ever. that that's where I remember him the most. Certainly, as as puke and being involved with Hawk and during that uh, 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 the alcoholism angle, right? Oh yeah. And then this happens to him, and again, it wasn't on television. Uh, they were taping television. They never aired it, of course. Um, and just your your reaction, having seen him all those years later for the first time on on Dark Side's Brawl for All episode. I mean, the, uh, it, it's a mixed bag because I, I hadn't seen him. I don't think I've seen an actual like current image of him and he just you know obviously he looks awful compared to what what he was in 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 the late 90s but his attitude his his you could just tell right from right from uh the interviews even though you know the limited amount that we see of him he just has an amazing attitude and just an amazing outlook and it's inspirational honestly yeah. to, that's to the see word how i was gonna say yeah is is he he, he it, it was inspirational. I remember leaving and just like my whole life being in perspective after walking out of that door, and just being like, oh yeah, like what he's gone through over these past whatever it had been twenty five years, you know, or maybe not quite is uh, is just staggering. Yep, he served as a, you know, not happy to be a testament to the the perils of the wrestling industry, but certainly uh, when he became a symbol of that, you know, didn't shy away from talking about it. I, I, it seems like you were sort of, because you included this in the episode, Evan, maybe a little trepidatious about bringing it up. You knew you had to, cause he's there in a wheelchair and people are going to wonder, like you said, but yeah. you kind of soft walked into it. Like, do you mind if I ask you about your injury? Like you saved it for the end. Was that something you thought he might push back against? Well, I just wasn't sure. You know, I obviously we're not talking about 
you know, the reason I'm in this house, the reason I'm interviewing him, you know, was for, yeah, it was for the Brawl for All episode. It was also for the Road Warriors episode, as you mentioned, because he was briefly part of that. Oh, yeah, that's right. Know, part of the Road Warriors. So um, I can't remember if beforehand I had asked if, you know, we wanted to touch on that or anything. Um, so I, I did kind of save it for the end, uh, not knowing ultimately if it was going to make it in. Um, but I think I wanted we wanted to have that option. And I, I'm, I'm super glad we did because we were able to you know, have his version of the story, which we're going to be listening to more of today. Um, but yeah, it was probably something that we were waiting for to do his episode because we touched on it, you know, in season two and maybe with time had gone by and there had been separation, we could have circled back around, but no, that's not an option. It's, you know, it's, it's sad. This will have to do in some ways. So tip of right, the cap right. to, to Darren Drostoff, you know, who, who, while he was a television star, really his career hadn't quite gotten going at the time this happened. In fact, as we'll get into a couple of false starts for him in terms of big storylines they were going to include him in with the legendary Road Warriors that never really, uh, Legion of Doom as well, they're known as in the WWF, that never really took off. So it's also a tale of, of what could have been for a guy who just, you know, shows up to uh, Long Island, New York to do his job one day and never walks again. Uh, in WWF. So we mentioned Puke. You know, the story was fairly well told on WWF television, you know, as far as where that nickname came from. But a man, did he have, let's say, a colorful, bileful way of des- <laughs> describing to dark side cameras, did Darren Drozdoff, where the Puke thing came from? It came from the fact that he just could not control his pregame vomit when he's climbing the college football ranks. I think he was a defensive lineman. And it's just something, even when he got onto the Denver Broncos for a brief period of time in the NFL, he could not help controlling uh, this vomit that would happen during the course of of play, let alone in the locker room beforehand. So uh, he embraces it. And by the time this uh, little piece of audio is done, I think you'll understand why he came to be known as, as puke. You know, when I was in high school, you know, I, I I started, I was a quarterback actually in high school and a defensive end and didn't start till my senior season or right before my senior season. I was getting ready for a game and, Started throwing up. I'm like, oh, okay, great. So the next game came, I throw up again. Oh, okay, <laughs> and it went on through my senior year, and I'm like, okay, you know, whatever. That's cool. That's cool. I still remember it was funny because <laughs> I'd throw up and I'd get dry mouth and everything. And one of my buddies, he was my center actually, two biggest guys on the team. I had a, Jose Flores was his name, my center, and he was probably 300 and some pounds, a uh, big Puerto Rican kid, and you know, I was probably 225, 230. I remember one of the games I'd puked so much, I'm so dry. I'm like, dude, you got to spit in my mouth. Oh, like, oh. Like, dude, my mouth's so dry. Just spit in my mouth so I can call it. Okay. Oh. So he spits in my mouth. I'm, got to spit around. I'm like, all right, I'm ready to go. So, you know, oh. that, and it just, you know, went from there. I, I My mouth was wet. I was good to go. <laughs> then I went to Maryland, and it just continued on before or it, during every football game. I would throw up, and they thought something was wrong with me, and try to keep me hydrated, and I'd you know drink a lot of fluids. And I think once I threw up, I'm drinking so many fluids, it would just keep, you know, keep coming out. And I have quite a few times where I, uh, you know, I knew I was going to throw up, so at the snap of the ball, I'd grab a hold of the offensive lineman and just get him a good spray. I got a guy from good spray. West Virginia one time, oh. grabbed the hold of him, pulled him in. I just square in the face, and he's mfing me and screaming, and I'm just. <sighs> oh my god! My JP, god. any thoughts? He said, "There's nothing wrong with me," but no, there is, pal. There's something <laughs> yeah, ask, wrong. Ask the uh, the opposition that you covered in vomit if there's something <laughs> wrong. Right. With you. Jesus Christ! And you ask him to spit in your mouth. Oh wow! Mouth is wet. I'm ready to go. That's an intimidation oh thing, god. man. It's like, what are you gonna do? Ban him from playing football because he throws up? Yes. You know, there there are a lot of, you know, athletes who have very bizarre rituals before getting in the game, getting in the zone, and, you know, having someone spit in your mouth is definitely probably at the top of the oh man most esoteric um, ones. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I do remember that. And again, I do remember also being like, that's got to be in the episode. Of course, you know? right? <laughs> I remember, you know, standing on a desk and yelling that at somebody at some point. Like, uh, you know, 
him get it, him someone spitting in his mouth and then also thinking how are we going to do that like recre what like in reenactment like whose spit is it going to be can oh we do God. that you know <laughs> i just i picture i picture a shot like it's kind of like a dutch angle shot like you don't see a full face just the 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 uh, um profile of an open mouth yep. and then just you got it spit dripping in <laughs> Yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah. What's the problem, totally. right? I mean, yeah, seriously. Exactly. So, yeah, that's crazy. And it is it is interesting that, you know, cuz I guess it's some involuntary nerves or something that would trigger him in that way. It's yeah. like what is it like Stan from South Park kind of thing, you know? <laughs> well, he talked to you guys about how, you know, some of the teams he played for would assign him uh, therapists who would be like picture the clouds, picture the... so he'd be doing this therapy thinking that it was sort of like a psychological thing that caused him to throw up and he'd do all the thinking of the clouds and people would make fun of him for meditating in the locker room and he got his ass in the field and he threw up all over people anyway. <laughs> Do we uh, have any, uh, did he, did he, were there any <laughs> stories that did he actually, uh, did he have any of those kind of pregame uh, uh, scenarios in uh, WWE at the time? Or? Well, that's a good point. No, he didn't say anything about that. Um, because one of the things that's notable about Beyond the Mat is he actually can't puke for Vince McMahon on demand. I know, isn't that he can't weird? can't do it. It has to be football. It has to be like the stakes of the game might have to be. I was going to say, maybe, maybe it's because you get a, you know, a real sport and. That could be it. You know, versus the predetermined nature of professional wrestling. I got, man, you know, that little clip we played at the beginning where he whispers, it's predetermined. I was like, this guy's got a sense of humor, Evan. Oh, this definitely. Guy would- definitely. He definitely did. And that comes across in the episode, too. Like, when he's, when we filmed him watching his Brawl for All matches and, like, ribbing Bradshaw, you know, still. He calls him a dirty bastard. I fucking loved that. I thought yeah, that was amazing. Right, right, right. It's amazing. But you could totally see how like just hearing that what we just heard right now a guy who who's who who's puking on command or or whatever he's you know this is you're, you're you could see why wrestling would go oh it's a gimmick you know we've never seen the puke guy before let's do it you know you could totally see how you could draw a line from you know where the wrestling world would seek this man out <laughs> well especially during the attitude era too like that oh just yeah fits into it you know and you talked about how Beyond the Mat, that sort of landmark documentary by Barry Blaustein about wrestling, kind of you know gave us a glimpse into the the, the process of how they develop characters for wrestlers at WWF at the oh, time. Yeah. And it really is a window into that because you know Vince famously or perhaps infamously, depending on what gimmick you ended up with, would sit you down and talk to you about your background. And he'd listen and he'd listen and he'd snatch on to something. You know, God forbid you said you're ever a garbage man oh, yeah. or a, you know, or something like that, or a, in Paul Bearer's case, that you were ever a mortician. Okay, we're, we're going with that, pal. Um, he can puke. And it draws us. <laughs> you know? Exactly. There's no way you're leaving Vince's office without puke being something. Wait, you, wait, you used to be a, a, a circus clown for kids' birthday parties? <laughs> really? <laughs> exactly. Tough day at the office for Matt Bourne. But, um, so, so there it is, and uh, he gets in, um, and he starts as we said, introduced to the WWF audience as this sort of like cousin to the Legion of Doom named Puke. And they're coming up at this point in time with an idea for LOD 2000, like the next generation of the Legion of Doom. And they've got new outfits. They used to wear the big spiked shoulder pads. It was a great episode Dark Side of the Ring did about the whole Road Warriors uh, story, um, Legion of Doom story. But yeah, so Draws is going to be worked into really... You know, one of the most famous tag teams, perhaps the most famous tag team ever in wrestling. Yeah. That was his first sort of uh, seat at the table. So very prominent position, very promising. And it was a time where, like like JP said, they were really pushing the envelope with some risque creative in, in WWF. And one of the things they came up with was trying to make on-screen dramatization of the fact that Hawk of the Road Warriors, one of the two, um, had a very difficult time with, with substance abuse throughout the course of his life. And it was very well known that he was had periods of struggle, and they decided to do an online storyline, on-screen storyline, pardon, where Hawk is struggling and is, is drunk on television, and he's, he's doing things that, you know, put him on the brink of disaster because he's showing up in no condition to perform, and infamously, they did an episode of Raw where um, he's, he's, he's chased up the Titantron, which is that big-ass screen <laughs> yeah. at the entranceway. And they rigged it up to make it look like he climbed all the way up there in a drunken stupor and actually fell off. You don't, of course, see him hit the ground and go splat. He falls into like a black hole. But there was, there was an idea there that never consummated because there, were, there ended up being some subsequent issues, you know, personnel issues between WWF and, and Hawk and Animal that didn't let the storyline ever take off. In fact, to hear Draws tell it, at one point it was supposed to, and to hear Animal tell it, at one point it was supposed to be Animal 
uh, that was in fact the one that was struggling with alcohol dependency. Interesting. Uh, so as perhaps not be too on the nose for the fact that that was very much Hawk's reputation for real in the wrestling industry, but still trying right. to get that on screen. And so the question would be, you know, like what caused Hawk to sort of fall off the wagon? And the answer, if things would have went a certain way, would have been draws. So they were literally going to go in that angle where we were going to, I was, and after that happened, he survived somehow. But, um, you know, that they, I was going to be, you know, or they would say, you know, like draws is the pusher. And they were leading towards like I was the one who, you know, that got him that way. I got him hooked on stuff again, and that's why I was starting to do stuff with Animal more. And he would come out, and he's messed up. And, you know, they had talked about, you know, actually continuing and going on to, there was a kid, Sean Stasiak, that was wrestling. And they had actually talked about maybe starting up a Legion of Dries and going against the Legion of Doom. Whoa. And uh, But then after everything went down, I guess well, I think... Hawk might have gotten hurt first, and then Animal ended up getting hurt, and they're like, well, you know, everything, you know, that idea is going to get scrapped. I was like, ah, it would have been interesting, I think. That would have been what we would have thought of his run for, you know? That would have been a huge breakthrough angle for him. I don't know about the Legion of Draws idea, JP. But <laughs> <laughs> Legion <laughs> but, but, of Draws? I mean, I would have Hulk Hogan and Ric Flair and Stone Cold Steve Austin. <laughs> <in> it <laughs> yeah, it you depends know? how you spell Draws. That's <laughs> oh, exactly man. <laughs> but But... But, it, you know, it, it's obviously like that era is the is the faction era, you know, of, of WWF. Everyone's in a faction. It's warring gangs, you know, and I could see it. I, I, I could definitely see it. And I kind of like the idea of him being part of, you know, Legion of Doom and then like defecting against them. But it is kind of a little strange that he would have been the one to like tempt, I guess, Hawk into his old sort of drug ways that's kind of weird <laughs> you know of all the characters that they put on screen in that risque attitude era i guess a drug dealer was not ever one they ever got ac got across the finish line but that's what they had in, in mind puke the drug dealer. Been, maybe <laughs> yeah. maybe some uh some some kind of bad memories with that you know with the, the all the drug stuff so i don't know yeah. who knows yeah but yeah that's that, that's it's that that would have been fascinating what did you think of that raw where hawk fell off the titan tron I remember being kind of bummed because I always, you know, as being a, a, a WWE fan starting in the in the early '90s, I never had like a real a real tenure with them as the dominant team and 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 really kicking an ass. So I was just like, no, don't break up the team, don't lose Hawk. Like it's you know, like come on. I mean, I hated the LOD 2000 thing to begin with. That thing was such a nightmare when they came out with their buzz cuts and like the same haircut and, and all that garbage. But like, you know, like when they came back in 97, I was, I was so pumped for that. And I, I loved it. I love that they came back. I remember that being a real moment where I was like, this is, this just makes me very upset because I didn't want them to break up. And I do recall if, and, and we'll move on, but. I, I also do remember in the Road Warriors episode we did talking to Hawk's family, and I do remember that they were very upset by the portrayal of Hawk, um, you know, in this time period. And it's interesting, too, because it's like we were just saying, Vince McMahon, oh, you used to puke, you know, then we're, you're puke, you know, and it's also kind of the same thing with the, the same attitude of the of the writing team at the time was let's take from the real you know, and, and build no matter how dark, no matter how dark, yeah. right. You know, you know, you'd see it with Hawk and later on you'd see it with Scott Hall and, um, and that certainly doesn't age very well. Yeah. It was a time when they were really trying to, to cut as close to the bone in terms of what they were putting on television. They, they being WWF and WCW where Scott Hall did that aforementioned on screen intoxication thing, uh, to compete with each other and just, you know, go, go lowest common denominator kind of stuff. But so that's what could have been as it regards uh, Darren Drozdov's WWF career. But we know that, unfortunately, if you know that didn't change the trajectory of history, it would have come to that night in October of 1999 where uh, he suffered the injury. Now, there's going to be a little bit in this clip that we're going to play for you that did make the Dark Side episode in Brawl for All in explaining uh, how Darren Drozdov came to be uh, paralyzed. But this is sort of like you know the full breath experience of him telling the story. I was actually going to win that match. You know, I didn't get a lot of wins, and 
originally it was planned for Monday Night Raw. Um, we ran long, and I was up in the gorilla position, which is you know right inside you know uh, fans will know right inside the uh, drapes there. And then they ended up running long, so they said, "Look, we're going to push it back to SmackDown," which Raw was live. On Monday nights, and I'm just I'm thankful it wasn't live, you know, for people to have to see. And then, so I got pushed back to SmackDown, and we did the whole that night. We had done the thing where I'd thrown up in D'Lo's bag and everything, and <laughs> uh, you know, gotten ready for that. And so they moved it back to Tuesday, and we got ready. And we went out there, and uh, you know, I was supposed to, you know, end up getting the win. Okay, sorry. Um, and you know, things were going, I remember going out there and, you know, I remember running to the corner, boom, D'Lo kicks me in the stomach and I go down. I remember him lifting me up and I, something just didn't feel right. And I, I wore a, like a shirt kind of thing. I had never wrestled him before, but I, you know, I, I'd come out and, and, uh, when he picked me up, I don't know if I slipped or what. But I remember going back down, I'm like, this isn't right, and I couldn't get my hands down, really. And I just remember hearing crack, crack. And I just went, oh, fuck, I just brought that. So I said, oh, fuck, I just oh. broke my neck. And and that's when I started, I was like, Teddy, you know, I was calling Teddy, I'm like, I broke my neck, man. And calling, you know, like my Albert was on the, the outside of the ring, because he was going to get involved in a match and told you, oh, and so they, you know, got the paramedics and everybody out there. And uh, I remember talking to the paramedics and being like, look, take your time. You know, I don't want to make it any worse. I mean, not that it, it could have been much where I could have died, which really would have been worse. But uh, and I just remember laying there and then them working on me, telling them to be careful. And of course, like, you know, it's just a weird thing to look at your body and you're like telling it to oh. move and it won't move. And it's like just a weird, you know, weird feeling. And, uh, so I, you know, I got carted, carted off and, you know, I saw, saw my, um, my ex, you know, she was my fiance at the time and all the guys and went in, you know, went into the, uh, got to the trauma center. Luckily it happened, which is weird. I had my first match for the WWE in the Long Island stadium and with Tom Pritchard. And then I had my last match in the Long Island, same place. It was just weird, you know, how it ended up, but, uh. Yeah, like I said, I remember being in there and them working, but was really messed up. Somebody stole my boots out of the freaking room, out of the uh, the uh, emergency what? room that I was in. When they took my boots off, somebody stole my boots. I was like, man, that's messed up. You know, come on, Jesus. you know, whatever. Evan, what's it like sitting there watching Draws tell the story of how he ended up in, in the in the condition that you were looking at him in? Oh, man. Um I mean, there's, it's like, I can go back to those times of, you know, cause I don't, I don't, uh, because, you know, our production has expanded and, you know, we have more people on staff now and more people to help out. I don't do all the interviews anymore, but back in this time I was, and we covered a lot of really difficult stories <laughs> that season. And I remember the toll it was actually taking on me just, you know, um, obviously the, the empathy I had, you know, for draws and everything that he went through yep. and everything else and I just remember feeling so bad you know and just like oh my god I just it's it's heartbreaking you know to hear him relive that again but notice how he's sneaking in jokes you know even when he's leading up to this moment you know he's and he's he's like almost he's almost more concerned about how I'm feeling about it you wow. know in a certain way about you know and he even said that in the he just said uh that he was glad it wasn't live so people didn't have to see that you know yeah um and so I think he is kind of thinking about other people in that moment. And I know that I'm sure we'll get into it when we talk about D'Lo too, is that he, he also does consider, you know, D'Lo's feelings about this too and what he's had to go through, you know, on, on the other end of this thing. So he's, I, I just found that to be very, um, you know, just a very amazing quality about him, you know. Um, and I just remember just, yeah, just him telling it and just being like, oh my God, this is a nightmare. JP, we haven't talked about this yet on Unheard, but you've done just a little bit of training for the ring. You know, you, you've gotten in there and done some seminars and stuff and learned a bit. I have. I mean, to hear Draws explain how quickly something can turn into something that can paralyze you. You know, the power bomb that D'Lo Brown was going for, kind of a standard issue move. They had done it over and over again on the circuit, and that's got to send a chill. I mean, getting in there and knowing what it feels like to just give your body up to gravity like that. 
I don't know if people know this as much. Uh, uh, maybe they do, and I and I just realized it because I I took the training. How much it is really reliant? How how much you depend on each other in the ring? You know, there's really there's so much that goes into it that if you don't do something, yep, every move requires both guys to really be in sync on it that if you don't do your part someone's going to get hurt even a suplex like if the guy receiving the suplex doesn't jump at the right time everyone's fucked and a power bomb is even worse because if you're not if you're not in sync with that you're you're going to you, I mean he's an example of it I mean we uh, I actually I remember I I wanted to do a power bomb in my last uh, uh, match that I did and we couldn't do it right. You know, like we just couldn't, couldn't get comfortable. We could, yeah. Like the, he, he couldn't rotate and I couldn't lift him up. He's, he was heavier than he looked and I couldn't, you know, just, we couldn't do it. So we, so we scrapped it and we did a timber slam instead. That's something so important to understand about wrestling to those that might be listening to this that aren't initiated. Like uh, the the moves are designed to make one person look like they're doing it to the other person, yep. but in reality, yep. it's the person receiving the move right. that's doing a lot of the vital work. A lot more of the work, yeah. A lot of the slams and suplexes and stuff like that all re- really require, you know, the the person receiving to be to definitely pull a lot of the weight. I mean, we did a in in the match, the last match I did, we did a beal out of the corner. I didn't fucking toss the guy. You yeah, know, he just he took tossed off. Yeah. himself. You know, I, I, I made it look like I threw him, but he tossed himself. Right. So, yeah, I mean, that, that stuff, yeah, it can, one, one little mistake, if someone's just not focused properly or someone's just, you know, it can, it can, I can see how it would be really, really problematic. Something that you said there too, it's like, you know, I, 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 I've never had a, I've never wrestled a match <laughs> per se, yeah. but, um, I did have an experience where I was, uh, forced to take a bump, <laughs> shall we say, mm. uh, I was, I was, uh, it was when we were filming the very first episode of the show, um, and we were down in Tennessee and we set up a ring to kind of film these hero shots of, um, of, uh, Dutch Mantel, um, outside of the ring and, all this stuff. And so there was a ring there and, you know, I'm a big fucking Mark, you know? So I'm like, Oh my God, this is my first time I get to just run amok in a ring, you know, like bouncing off the ropes, like a jackass, you know, and the whole thing. And we also had another wrestler there. His name, his name um, was uh, Josephus uh, RIP. Actually, he's no longer with us, but he was there. And uh, I, you know, Dutch just took one look at me, you know, bouncing off these ropes and pretending I'm a wrestler. And like, and he's like, just slam the kid, you know, slam the shit out of this kid. And I remember he lifted me up, went for a body slam, put some extra little, you know, weight into it and dropped me down on the mat, man. And I'll, I'll never forget. It was like a shot rang out. It was like every single bump I had ever seen ever in wrestling you know, McFoley came to mind for sure. McFoley came to mind. All this stuff just, it recontextualized every bump I'd ever seen. The idea of coming off the top rope is a nightmare. Like just all of that, because it is practically getting slammed on, on plywood boards and, and no give. And, and it was just like, what, this is what these guys are doing. What? The amount of pain I felt the first, after the first day, I literally, I woke up in my bed and I could not I couldn't move. I couldn't roll. I, I couldn't find a way to make myself roll over where I wasn't going to be in intense pain because it's just like, it's not like, you know, searing sharp pain. It's just body ache. It's just my entire body was aching. And I, I, <laughs> I learned my lesson as, as, as Jack can attest to. And I, and, and the episode that we recorded on it, I had to, you know, I brought a bunch of, I'd been uh, uh, prescribed painkillers for, you know, something. And I just had leftovers cause I, I didn't need them anymore. And so I was like, well, shit, I'm bringing, I'm bringing these with me cause I don't want to be, I don't want to be hurting in the next day. You know, I want to be able to get up there and not question if I can do the moves and stuff. And there you go. That's it right there. And that's, that's for an intensive, let alone on the road. And can you imagine, I mean, just the, you know, the, the impact you guys described doing very basic slam and coming down in your head, like poor Drostoff did. Oh um, God. And there's one other X factor here, which we haven't mentioned yet, which is he says just in that clip that you played was that he was wearing a a different style shirt. He was wearing a mesh 
kind of <laughs> goth, you know, mesh shirt, which I, I do remember him talking about being it, that that was sort of a weird thing because you know D'Lo's got to get the grap, you know, he's got to grapple him as he's as he's as the force of him is coming up into the power bomb, and you know, it maybe he could have slipped because of that material is is you know whatever it is. Uh, let's uh, let's hear from D'Lo because you guys were able to connect with D'Lo uh, as well. Did did you guys approach D'Lo when you realized you had this? from draws that you wanted another side of it or, or did you already have him sitting for what the new Jack episode perhaps? Yeah, we had him sitting for new Jack because we knew we wanted, cause he was in the gangsters, which we've talked about in this show. And then it was kind of this thing where it's like, Whoa, D'Lo actually does touch a lot of the, you know, other stories of the season. He not only, you know, had, you know, was a part of this story with draws, but also was there the night Owen Hart passed away. So there was just a lot of things we wound up having to talk to him about. And um, yeah, this was just one of the things. And it was definitely the hardest thing of the whole day that he had to talk about. Uh, we put the match together. We we do spots we have done hundreds of times on house shows around the country. So it was literally nothing we were trying new. It was just stuff we were doing. Um, so we go out there, we have the match. And I remember the running powerbomb spot. I remember sitting in the corner and ready to go do it and pulled him up and we didn't go and we just fell forward and that had never happened to me before. And I remember hitting and going, are you okay? And I'm going, I, I can't move. And I, said, I said, stop messing with me. You okay? I can't move. Right then we sat there and I, I, I stood, stood, stood and everything shut down. And you can see this look, I mean, you can see the look of, of bewilderment, like, like what is going on on my face? And then I leave the ramp, I leave the ring and I go up the ramp and I'm waiting in the gorilla. And Bruce Pritchett was there, Vince was there. Um, and I see him getting worked on. Um, and I'm like, okay, this, this is no problem. It's, he'll go. It's a, just, it's a stinger. It's a, one of a million things. Um, so they bring him up, and I remember crying next to him, telling him, "I'm oh, sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It should never happen." And and Frost is going, "It's okay, dog. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay." So he goes off to the hospital. I run and change, and I go to the hospital, and then we're sitting there and. I remember the doctor coming out and explaining to us, like, so nonchalantly, like, oh, yeah, it's just, this just shifted here, and once that pops back, everything's going to be okay. And I was like, okay, he's going to be good. He's going to be okay. And that, that was not the case. Jeez. Yeah, it took a little while for the, the extent of the damage to become totally clear. But they, you know, they always talked, uh, right, Evan, uh, favorably about each other, and Draw yeah. certainly said all the right things as it regards, you know, never holding it against the guy. He, he did kind of make reference to, and Adilo's made reference to this, where there was some friction with other members of Draws' family. He, he had made reference as he was being taken to the back after the accident that he was you know, dating at the time, uh, I think a fiance. The, it was actually the seamstress that worked for the WWE at the time. And there was some tension there, I believe. It wasn't all, you know, it's all good, brother, like zero tension. Oh, yeah. I mean, when something like that happens, it's just so complicated, <laughs> you know, and so many different levels but it, i mean it is it is a that that is a an interesting point about it like what we were talking about earlier is that wrestling is a collaboration it's a dance you know you have a dancing partner and you know you were talking about with these moves it's like some you know in order to successfully execute them you know one person has to post off the other and they have to you know shift their weight and they have to you know launch their body weight off of another person's body part you know and um you know it's it's hard to assess you know whose mistake it is sometimes it's just the gravity of the situation the combination of maybe his outfit and just you know some you know you never know but that's what makes it difficult to assess blame and i think that draws knows that and and again it's a testament to the kind of guy he is that he understands the burden that this also is for delo to have to live with you know which is something that i don't think I think it, it's that would be very difficult, you know, for anyone. If I was in that situation, or if you, anyone, you know, to have that outlook, you know, and to not, you know, because I mean, just from the brief glimpse that I saw being at his house of what his day to day life is, 
you know, um, I can I, I can only imagine how difficult it is, how difficult it was on a daily, hourly basis. What what kind of things are you thinking of when you say that? Just like getting around or getting fed or? I just noticed that he was in, he was just in pain, like in, oh, in general, yeah. you know, like just there was a, there was a lot of pain he was in. Um, there were times where he had to shift weight around on the chair um, in because of pain and things um, and not being able to move like there, like the chair was designed to, you know, lower him, you know, make him go back and he'd, he'd sit in different, you know, positions and things like that. Um, just, you know, not that I saw this or anything, but just in knowing that with his aids, like transporting him out of the chair and into bed or the bathroom or whatever, you know, it's, uh, or however they did that. It's just, just the amount of work that has to go into and, and pain existing like this is just, it's so heavy, man. It's like one of the heaviest, it's probably one of the heaviest things I've like been around, you know, just, just trying to fathom, just trying to fathom, you know, like putting myself in, in that position. And one window you had into that sort of reality of Darren Drozdov's life was when he showed you a particular specially equipped wheelchair that he and his friends, including the former CEO of Under Armour, Kevin Plank, who I understand was his roommate yeah, in college, right. they all got together and raised some money to buy him this diesel looking thing. This <laughs> is this is a wheelchair for folks like Darren who like to hunt, who love the outdoors, a woodsman. And despite the fact that he's completely paralyzed from the neck down, he uh, ended up with this wheelchair device that allowed the, uh, you know, it wasn't safe to be a deer around here in Drozdov's <laughs> house, even in his state. Let's listen. It's freaking cool. My buddies, uh, you know, from college, they had gotten together and they were raising money to get it for me and uh, killed two deer so far, you know, with it. And uh, the last one we actually put on YouTube, I think, uh, it's there with me. We have a lighted and lighted dock. So when I, you know, I use actually something like this, I can control the, the the crossbow will be up, down, left, right with my hand. And then when I shoot, it's, this is my water straw. When I shoot, I have a what straw. What the fuck? And when I breathe into it, it squeezes the trigger. And uh, so my aide, he'd put a GoPro on top of it. And there's a picture of it there with me. You know, in, in the thing, you see the, when I squeeze, you see the arrow flying through the air because it's a light, light, bright orange, you know, and hitting the deer and then... Uh, you know, taking off and later on we got pictures of it and everything. And uh, I just, I, you know, I love being out in the woods and it gave me a chance to get back out there. I'm glad it could get out there, JP, but, but, but a wheelchair that can fire a crossbow by breathing into uh, a straw. I mean, it's, it's something, something says to me that, that, that might not have been a legal thing to do. Yeah, oh, it's, it's a thing for, for I mean, hunting to yeah, have a straw paralyzed and love to just to hunt. blow and, and all of a sudden <laughs> you can, well, maybe that was a, a custom apparatus for him, but did he take it outside Evan? Did he show you how it works? He did. And that was definitely something we knew about because we had seen that video online of him hunting with this, you know, it's, it looks like a GI Joe kind of, you know, like totally. vehicle, you know, it's a whole apparatus that he, that his chair drives into. You know, it's like a tank, essentially. I think it has tank treads, if I remember that is correctly. Insane. Yeah, and I and I, I just remember um, you know, like, yeah, we gotta get some B roll of that. And um and of course we did. And to me it, it was like uh because all, all around his house, like when we got to his house, there was like a very kind of log cabin y feeling to it. Um and inside there was a lot of uh, f framed photographs from before the accident with him holding up like, uh, you know, he, he, was, he was a fisherman, so he loved to fish and he loved to hunt. So there was a lot of photos of him from his wrestling time period and his football time period of when he was out in the elements, you know, hunting. And so the, so the fact that he's still able to do that is kind of, it is amazing. It is amazing that he's able to do that still in some way. You know, um, and uh, we definitely and he was so down and eager to show us. He couldn't wait till we could get out there and fire that thing up, you know, so <laughs> he's very proud of it and and stoked. <laughs> so that was cool to see. I just I just picture, you know, like, you know, he's out there hunting. He's he's you know, it's just again, very, very stealth like he's he sees a deer or something and and he hits. But the deer's not, you know, it's not a fatal shot. 
And so the deer starts running away. And then all of a sudden, I just picture him like right. chasing down this thing on this, on this mini, like, I guess to me, you're describing the, uh, the Sergeant Slaughter vehicle from GI Joe. There, yeah, that, exactly. That, that, you know, <laughs> hunting down this, this animal. Like, <laughs> that's amazing. It's all camouflage. <laughs> like it's all like hidden, yeah. you know, in the woods. Yeah. And then all of a sudden these floodlights just turn on and it's running this poor deer down. And here's the thing, you know, the deer seen it all. He's hung around the neighborhood. He survived, you know, the camo tough guys. He knows his way around. He knows that there's a guy with this special wheelchair, but, but it was when he caught eye of this guy once and he just started puking everywhere. (laughs) Yeah. Right. (laughs) That the deer really didn't know what the fuck to do. Yeah, exactly. um, Yeah. You know, I don't know. Just speaking personally, I always wondered, what came of Darren Drozdov, not just from the perspective of, you know, how his injuries healed. We know he'd never walked again, but just, you know, what his day to day was like. You never saw really a depiction of the man. Um, it, perhaps it was there and I just didn't seek it out. But I remember watching the Brawl for All episode of Dark Side of the Ring and it just smacked me right in the face. I was like, this is this is what happened to Darren Drozdov. This is what he looks like all these years later. Um, you know, I don't know. I, I guess I just thought maybe he'd be in a wheelchair and you know, you'd be able to shoot him in a way where it wasn't completely obvious that something happened to him. But, you know, like the drinking straw near his face and just, you know, the visage of sort of like his upper torso. It was just, I don't know, it was just really um, a reminder of not only the things that can go wrong in wrestling, but how easily we can forget the casualties of the ring. Oh, yeah, 100%. And like, you know, uh, Jim Cornette gets emotional in the episode talking about it. Um you know, because obviously he's so passionate about the industry and, and constantly reminds people, you know, about how this isn't, you know, he, he says it's not ballet, but I mean, ballet is also brutal on your body. Yeah. But, but, you know, what he means is, you know, that that uh, I think as fans, we do get very jaded and take it for granted, you know, how insane this is that these people that we idolize or we you know, are fans of that, that really put what they put their bodies through. And it's crazy. And especially now in today's world, all the spots you see, it's just an escalation of more and more high risk, more and more, um, you know, just, j- just for the sake of getting the pop when, you know, I think, and I think it's, it is going in the wrong direction, you know, for that. Cause we're getting desensitized is the word I was looking for. Um, but yeah, man, it's just any one little thing that could happen, one little false move, and um, you know this could be your future. It's it's just it's crazy. And isn't it always the little things, JP? We've talked about this on the lapsed fan ad nauseum. Like the injuries that have done the most damage to wrestlers over the years have been in the process of doing what you would consider the lesser risk moves. The the in between the transition, this power bomb that he went up for, Darren Drozdov, it was a pretty standard part of D'Lo Brown's offense. It wasn't his finisher. Uh, you know, it wasn't something that was designed to look so devastating that you could never get up again. And it wasn't a big dive off a balcony or a ladder or some crazy Cirque du Soleil thing. It was pretty basic. And those can sometimes be the ones that those almost always seem to be the ones that, that do yeah. the, the lasting damage. It's so strange. I, I actually remember, you know, wrestlers we've worked with on the show who play the wrestlers on a reenactments. And um, I, I think I was like a wanting to learn, you know, how to take a move being a stupid mark again and uh suggested a hip toss and they're like no dude fucking hip toss is brutal you know yeah and you're just like a, really a hip toss like that's one of the basic moves on the wrestling games you know that's like not even one of the strong <laughs> moves you know but it's it's brutal to take a hip toss that's why you don't see them that often anymore so it is a weird disconnect you know between what we see on television and what these people are going through in the ring you know a lot to learn about the wrestling uh, business and the the rigors of the wrestling ring from Darren Drozdov's story. But of course, someone put in a position like this who has to decide what kind of attitude am I going to have for the rest of my days in this wheelchair? A lot to learn about about life as well. And uh, Droz talked about what he was clinging to in his life when you sat with him, Evan, uh, to bring joy, um, even at a time when he has to look back at this sort of stark line in his life story where it, it was never the same. Well, I mean, life doesn't end, you know, once you're in a wheelchair, you know, or, or whatever condition you're in, you know, there's always, well, hopefully, I don't say always, but, you know, most always a way where you can work around things. I mean, I've seen guys, you know, fishing with literally no arms or legs, and this guy's casting with, like, 
a nub and he hell he cast better than I could probably when I wasn't hurt. But I mean, you know, people you learn to adapt to things, and you know, it's just sometimes, you know, you're like, ah, do I want to do this? But you know, sometimes you just got to push yourself a little, and you know, go past what you, you know, think you can do, and you just try to do what you know, you know, go over and above, and uh, enjoy yourself. That's all you can do is, you know, you got to live your life and enjoy as much as you can, and you know, it's been a long twenty years, but you know, I, I. Wouldn't, I'm glad I survived, and you know I'm glad I get to see my niece and nephews grow up and doing what they're doing, and you know it's uh it's just great to be around family. Aaron Drozdoff died June 30th, 2023, at the Atlantic Care Regional Medical Center in Pomona, New Jersey. He was 54. Evan, any closing comments? You know, seeing his outlook, you know, in that in in that, it's just puts so much yeah. into perspective, and it is inspiring. It sounds cheesy to say that. Like it's almost a stock thing to say, but I think it really is true. It is inspiring. It does put your life in perspective, you know, to think about those types of things. What are really the important things about life? Um, and for someone to really just even have to develop this, the mental strength to carry forward after something like that is just awe-inspiring. It just is. You know, I just I can't even imagine it. Um, and I'm just grateful for the opportunity that we had to interview him. For even to something as stupid as the Pro Football. <laughs> yeah, you know? of all the things but, to bring you guys together. I know, I know. And I feel bad for that. I feel like, you know, we really should have um, dedicated an episode to him. Maybe it's not too late. Maybe there is a way to do it still. Um, there probably is. I will say, one of the loose threads for this whole saga to me is whether or not Adilo and Draws ever sat down to watch the video. Because this was recorded, unlike the Owen Hart episode, yeah. where the cameras weren't directed at the ring when he tragically fell from the ceiling. And this took place just months after Omen Hart's untimely death, by the way. I don't want to name any names on air, but I, I do know of some folks that have seen it. I saw a recent interview with D'Lo, and I was trying to read between the lines of what he was saying, and it definitely seemed to me like there was a moment. And I don't think this was the case when you sat with Draws, because having read the transcript, he didn't make any reference to it and made it seem like he's never watched it. D'Lo did seem to talk about it as a moment that did happen where he and Draws actually sat together and watched the video. God, I don't know. Yeah, that'd be interesting. Just made a final sort yeah. of assessment of what, I, what actually happened, uh, happened that night. But that's perhaps, uh, perhaps a terrain to take it. I mean, and, and thanks to you guys, we do I'm wet. Have, I'm ready. You know, I'm wet. Uh, Let's go. Well, I'm ready. <laughs> well, well draws, draws is happy to hear it, but whose spit are you using <laughs> is the question. Oh, wow. oh my God. Um, that is brutal. So this is... And another uh, episode of Unheard from the folks at Dark Side of the Ring. We do hope you enjoyed uh, this look at the, the life, career, the, the injury, and the, the aftermath and the optimism of Darren Drozdov. So much more to come from us and the Dark Side archives, but for now, it's, it's back to the vault for us, and we'll see you next time on Dark Side of the Ring, Unheard. <laughs>